Okay, so I guess it's time to get underway here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, something that is just now starting to get attention, although we should have been paying attention for the last 30, 40 years, uh, but the whole concept of technology not being neutral. So what I'm going to do is uh, kind of go through uh, some of the uh, issues here about uh, how tech isn't, in fact, uh, just a neutral thing, where, uh, which is what it's often portrayed as, is if we just get the tech, that takes the human part of the equation out, and therefore uh, we get rid of all of the subjective parts, and we get a neutral, fair society uh, by following the technology. But that's not uh, really everything that we have to talk about. So what I'm going to do here is kind of break it up into a, a series of propositions and issues, then some examples, and then wind up with what we can do about uh, the problems that I hope by the end of this you will agree are in fact problems. So uh, first off, there's the scope of the problem, where there is a fair amount of uh, talk about the new technological regime and how that's affecting society and what we need to watch out for. But unfortunately, it's not always talking about the right things. Uh, there's a lot of talk about privacy and security as if they're the same thing and they're actually vastly different, although it is hard to have privacy without security it's really easy to have security without privacy. Well, at least as easy as it is to have security, period. But uh, security does not guarantee privacy. Um, but then there's talk about identity theft. There's talk about just what's happening with uh, what I'll refer to as the robot overlords, where we're giving away our humanity to computers. Um, but there's a lot that isn't talked about. We're kind of talking about the wrong things. What I think is more important to talk about is the fairness. What, what is happening and how that affects our society, how technology is reinforcing bias rather than eliminating bias, how we are losing accountability and transparency, and uh, how there, it's easy, um, the term I'm using here is tech washing, where if you just say, oh, it's the technology, you can hide problems and uh, pretend that it's just in the technology and not underlying problems. And overall, uh, then because of these issues, we create a two-tier society. Um, it's, for decades, we've talked about it as the digital haves and have-nots, uh, but that's been more in the concept of who has access to technology. Now we're recognizing it not just as who has access, but who is impacted by it. And again, a division into uh, those with power, those without power. So what causes all of this is uh, something that I think we're all relatively familiar with, uh, which is uh, what I refer to here as data hemorrhaging, where data is moving around in ways that it never moved around before. And in every app we use, every programmer use, every 
interaction, even in the brick and mortar world, is increasingly tracked and fed into uh, data uh, warehouses and analytics. And, uh, oh, I should say in all of this that although some of this is going to come across as very negative about technology, that's not my point at all. I am not a Luddite. I do not want to go back to a paper world. Uh, although I have now been a lawyer for too long, uh, my original training and my original work is I was a software developer. I, I like technology. Technology is good stuff. We just have to have the right rules around it. So um, we have all of this where uh, because data is changing so much, we uh, now have to view how we react to it differently. The, the game really is changing. And there are really four big areas I want to talk about there. Uh, they, I, each of them are, well, they are linked with each other, but they each have individual aspects that lead to increasing bias, and arguably each one of them individually could mean we need to reassess uh, the regime, uh, and definitely together they do. So the first is just aggregation, that we have a ton of uh, data now, which it's not just that there's more data being collected on us, but it's that our silos have gone away. So I, even in the old days where various entities, whether it was, uh, and forgive me, a lot of this is more government focused than private sector just because that's the area I have more experience with. So a lot of criminal justice here. But the same thing is true in the private sector, that when company A kept data on you, even going back, you know, wherever, everyone had their own mailing list, there wasn't so much transfer of information between companies and between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, it, if you go to the real old days, literally stuff was stored in file cabinets and, you know, one entity had that. Now it's increasingly all hooked together, uh, allowing data to be both intentionally and unintentionally shared and moving around. Um, so then that enables analytics, where uh, the entire science of analytics depends on having a lot of data. No one talked about it when there were limited data sets. It's you need this mass aggregation of data, but then once you have that, you can go to work and play and try to discover interesting things. I, often it's what ads should I target, but it's also things like who's at risk of being a terrorist or a criminal or just a social undesirable, or somebody, uh, not just targeted ads, but what do you look at for who are your desirable customers, your undesirable customers, who gets offers made available to them, so digital redlining. Um, and I, one of the things that's interesting about this is there's very little that can be done uh, in terms of uh, protecting privacy in this world of changing data. So one of the most interesting things is a variety of entities at various times have tried to be good, responsible players uh, 
recognizing the value of data and recognizing the value of privacy so they would release anonymized data sets. But almost every time that has happened, when <laughs> anybody has gone to work on it, they've been able to de-anonymize. So one of the most famous examples, which now is probably eight years old, something like that, was I, I believe it was AOL released anonymized uh, search histories, which uh, was going to be really interesting information for researchers to be able to see how people are using the internet, et cetera. But people very quickly figured out, boy, just knowing what people are searching for, you can often figure out who that person is. Turns out, among other things, that most of us search for ourselves every now and then to see what's out there. And uh, so just looking at that, you look at a few other things, and you could rapidly de-anonymize this anonymous uh, data set turned into a whole fiasco for what was actually a well-intentioned uh, move. But that's uh, the name of the game. They, I, Increasingly, it's not just looking at simple metrics there, but just as there are analytics uh, looking at uh, information for a variety of purposes, one of those can be re-identifying people. Uh, City of Seattle, interestingly enough, recently uh, did a study of this and I uh, released a report uh, on their open data uh, project, which basically said, concluded that there was no way to protect privacy by anonymization. Uh, they when in doubt uh, about releasing data, they, I, uh, city agencies should decide not to release any personal information because e even with attempts to protect it. Now, there are questions about when that can and cannot be done under the Public Records Act, but it shows the scope of the problem. Next huge game changer is predictive metrics, which in a sense is a subset of analytics uh, because it looks not just at trying to figure out, looking through the set of data, what has this person done in the past, but to predict what the person will do in the future. And again, there are relatively benign forms of it, such as predicting whether they're going to buy the next car or the next roll of toilet paper or whatever. But it's increasingly used for much more serious things like predictive policing and predictive sentencing, where uh, it's not quite at the level of the precogs from Minority Report, but it's getting there. Uh, they, one of the big things being championed in uh, policing departments around the country is this idea of predictive policing, using the analytics to figure out uh, the term they often use is the crime hotspots, and therefore uh, devoting more resources to that to prevent crime, uh, but also to the level of which individuals are most likely uh, to commit crime, or which individuals are most likely to recommit crime. So predictive sentencing uh, basically is trying to take a lot of the human equation out of uh, determining what sentences are by looking at various factors for this person and determining how likely are they to commit a new crime, do we need to keep them in longer? Uh, same for uh, pretrial release. Is this person a danger? 
increasingly this is being done not by judges doing uh, individual human evaluation or probation officers or any of that, but by a few now very widely used uh, sentencing algorithms uh, or programs, really. It, it's, we started down this uh, with the concept of um, uh, just a sentencing grid, uh, which was actually written into statute that basically says you get so many points for uh, each thing and based on that like how many previous crimes what kind they are and this is the sentence you should get that admittedly is an algorithm but it was a simple human applied algorithm now it's much less transparent and i'll get into this a little more but is um just being plugging data into a program such as compass and you get back here's the recommended sentence without knowing what the breakdown is um, i'll come back and talk about that in a little more detail let me get on to the fourth uh, game changer which is machine learning so i now increasingly i uh, and you, it's a form of AI, it's part of AI. I might talk about it just as AI. I know machine learning and AI are not synonymous, but for purposes of this talk, they might as well be. Um, so I, here we're increasingly getting into an area where not even the developers end up knowing what the algorithm is going to be. So. Uh, you start out with, let, let's look at, again, that sentencing grid. The basic uh, paradigm used to be, we all knew what the algorithm was. It had a few inputs. You look up in the chart, and that's it. Okay. Then you put it into a program. We, we don't know exactly what factors are going into it, but somebody had that coded in. And the next step is, over time, the machine looking at the data set and what outcomes are develops new algorithms so we don't even know how it's coming up with the answer but it's just spitting out uh, this person is this much of a risk so all of those are data game changers and so then what does this mean I don't think there's really any doubt anymore in today's information society, data is power. Uh, they, those of us who are able to uh, control the data, control how it's used, control how our data is used, have more power than those who are not able to do that. And so, uh, and almost all of this is going on out of our view entirely. They, I, I'm willing to bet that any of you who bothered showing up for this talk already are more knowledgeable about these issues than 95% of the people in the country, probably 99%. Most people simply have no idea how their data is being used and how it affects them. They, I, they just see results, they think that's normal, they don't know whether it's individualized to them or to others, or it's just, oh, this oddity, I, but they don't understand things that are having major effects on their life, I, whether it is sentencing uh, parole, whether it is uh, just how much they have to pay for their insurance, how much they have to pay for their loans. Everything is being done in ways that are largely incomprehensible to almost everybody affected by them. Which brings us to 
the reality that we don't have a way to control that for uh, not only can we not control how our data is moving, we can't really even know how it is working. One of the huge problems uh, in today's society for people trying to deal with these issues is the inability to find out information. They, I, particularly again, I'm talking about the public sector governments, they traditionally, we have been able to find out quite a lot of information about how our governments work through uh, Freedom of Information Act or State Equivalent Public Records Act, uh, transparent government documents that let us know how things work. But as many of these fundamental decisions are now outsourced uh, to technologies, there are a variety of ways that are preventing people from learning how they work. Uh, so, for example, non-disclosure agreements uh, have been used uh, where entities, uh, and I'll talk more about stingrays in a little bit, but they have kept uh, people from being able to find out how stingrays work, what they are uh, doing, and it's because that's signed between the government and the private contractor and then is asserted as uh, meaning can't respond to records requests. Um, similarly, the use of uh, trade secret uh, arguments where the algorithmic developers say, hey, no, this is our special sauce. We can't tell you how the sauce is because that's why we have a value proposition versus our competitor. So no, you can't know how we come up with our answers you just have to trust us that they're the right answers. Um, and uh, researchers can't probe these themselves because of things such as uh, the CFAA, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, which prohibits reverse engineering. So I can't even go in and try to figure it out. And amazingly to me, uh, private entities are even asserting First Amendment arguments, saying that uh, that protects them from uh, both being limited on how they can share information and on having to disclose anything about what they are doing. Um, of course, at the ACLU, we believe strongly in the First Amendment, um, but it really applies to speech, not so much data collection. Um, so, I, just a reminder to everybody, everyone wants your data. It it's used to be limited, you know, I'll show my age that it used to be a joke about Radio Shack being the one that whenever you went in to you know, buy a transistor, you needed to give them your address and get on that. But, and at the time, it was a joke because they were an outlier. That didn't happen anywhere else. Now, everybody wants your data all the time. It's vastly facilitated by online, uh, activity for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, although we all should know better, it still feels anonymous to be sitting in front of your computer at home and it's like, oh, no one's seeing me here, when in fact you're being tracked far more than you are walking down the street. Um, but also it means that any transaction you do online requires a bunch of information in order to work. You're not walking into a store, paying cash, and walking out with no record. They, if you want something as simple as a roll of toilet paper delivered to your house, 
you need to give your name, address, credit card number. Um, so information is being collected everywhere there. But it's also deliberately being collected not just to facilitate, but because despite Facebook's protest, eh, protestations, we are the uh, product, not the uh, consumer. Uh, and there's great value in collecting data. It's also being collected by government entities because they very much have also realized that data is power. They, in order to be more efficient, they need more data. To provide better service, they need more data. Some with benign intents, some with not so benign intents. Um, you know, surveillance is great if they have your best interests in mind and always have your best interests in mind. But do we really believe that and trust that it will always be that way? I hope not. Um, so uh, there's I just a, um, there are few examples uh, out here that it's, uh, and just some uh, government, uh, well, I say government. Many of, almost all of these are actually private entities whose sole customers are the government. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, predictive policing, geophedia, uh, public safety, they're all private entities developing great algorithms and data analytics, which lets small town USA police department come into the 21st century uh, without having to understand all of the technology. We'll take that out of your hands and just give you this great, easy to use, uh, drag and drop, uh, perfect solution. Um, and so where those private entities are gaining data and how often isn't examined uh, and sometimes is part of that secret sauce uh, sometimes is talked about, uh, but then when they do talk about it, it doesn't necessarily work out well for them. Geophedia, uh, for example, uh, was all about uh, getting social uh, media uh, information and doing geofencing and letting uh, police departments track and figure out through social media. After they did a little too much advertising and hyping that, uh, various privacy advocates got upset and convinced Facebook to uh, cut off the flow. Now that Facebook is only one source, it's not like Geophedia is out of business, um, but uh, now it's probably even less transparent about what their sources of information are. So, what does this mean when everybody wants your data? It means we are back to the haves and have-nots, uh, where some of us can protect ourselves with Tor, VPN, etc., and others can't. So, um, kind of the core of what I want to talk about, and I've spent way too long on other issues, is how the technology can amplify bias. They, instead of uh, being cures for human bias, they're introducing new bias. And there are trade-offs in all of these algorithms that we don't know about. So here's just a little example. One of the things that happens increasingly with these algorithms that reinforces bias is that those in power who are using them, for example, for pretrial release, will absolutely depend on and cite the output of the program if it comes up with the answer they agree with. And so it's more likely 
to say, oh yeah, that guy definitely shouldn't go out. But then if it comes up with a different answer, they're like, eh, it's not really understanding all of the right factors. We're going to go with what we know is better. Um, and there are a variety of ways this happens. One is that who's designing the algorithms uh, is a very limited subset. They, uh, for example, I, somewhere here I have this information and it's doing a weird thing, but the vast majority of uh, these systems are developed by white, male, relatively affluent uh, people. And you get biases that come into how the design. I know this back when I was a software developer and designing things like Excel, that we put in features that were cool to us and thought this was our, uh, that that was worldview. I, also did a program called Microsoft Money, which probably no one's heard of, it's long ago, quick and equivalent. But we were looking at, okay, what's good for financial planning? And strangely enough, a bunch of young, rich, white people came up with stuff that was useful for our world of financial planning, but didn't necessarily translate all that well to somebody living paycheck to paycheck, or doing payday loans, it, it, a whole uh, different mechanism. Same thing happens in all of these other. It's almost uh, impossible not to. And people are not asking the right questions. Uh, they're, they're looking at not how to uh, make the system fair or even asking about is it fair, it's does it work but without even really asking how do we measure whether it works. And so uh, one of big recent things is there's come out a lot of research now that facial recognition is much, much different for white people than for black people because Oddly enough, the database they started with to learn all of this on was white. And then how that affects people matters. And it, but, and there aren't necessarily right and wrong answers that are obvious, but you need to at least ask the question and start looking at it. Um, and there's, uh, no, really no ethics, you know, it, like we have a whole huge body of medical ethics, legal ethics, you can laugh at it, but we actually do have that body. Um, and I, but nothing in terms of software design, algorithmic design ethics, and not even an understanding of how to measure it. So, uh, for example, um, looking at uh, predictive policing, how much of it correctly identifies neutral hotspots in terms of where crime is versus how much is, if we identify this place and put all our cops there, Strangely enough, that's where they're going to make most arrests, which then makes that a hot spot. Hey, we're successful. Um, so you need to figure out how you uh, do that. Uh, you need to figure out what it means uh, by being neutral, what it means to have uh, an outcome that is fair. And sometimes that's obvious, sometimes that's not obvious. Uh, say, for example, we determine that, in fact, data shows that there is a correlation between, let's say, people with long ears and uh, crime rates, okay? 
does that mean that we actually should treat everybody with long ears as more of a criminal suspect, do higher crime, or is that something that we decide societally, no, we should be individual? Those are questions that need to be asked and answered by policymakers, and they're not now. Um, and uh, we don't have ways to find out what, uh, how those decisions are being made, whether that's even being considered, and uh, how it applies. A big part of this is contracting. They, as I said, that example of the small town police department, they don't have a lot of money. Uh, they want to turn it over just to a quick, easy solution that's better than trying to develop their own in-house technology, but that also takes accountability away. It's everywhere. They, you know, that's one map. You can come up with examples from every state of various uh, different problems with technology. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, government gets our uh, information. There's a lot of things. This uh, was actually um, famous Snowden uh, released uh, NSA document. Uh, thank God for Snowden, true American hero. Um, but I, so that shows one of the ways NSA was getting information at a more local level, cell site simulators, uh, stingrays, hailstorm, uh, dirt boxes, you name, there's a million different names for them. Uh, just in quick, uh, if anyone doesn't know, it's a device that basically mimics a uh, cell tower, and so your phones collect, uh, connect to that device instead of the cell tower giving information about location and depending on the device, possibly other information from your phone. Um, no, it, it's just now barely starting to come out how these work. This is a notorious example of uh, the manuf main manufacturer of this, Harris Corporation, got the FBI to mandate uh, non-disclosure agreements uh, when they made it available to local police departments, uh, and that has been used uh, to uh, thwart people learning anything about it. It really wasn't until just a few years ago where one guy finally who was uh, tracked down for I want to say it was it was a wire fraud case. I forget exactly what uh, form what, but couldn't figure out how he was caught, and eventually uh, came across the Stingray. It's done a lot of work on that. Um, we continue uh, to fight on that locally. We've been trying to get information from City of Tacoma. Are suing them for more information about uh, how they use. Uh, cell site simulators. They're available uh, not just locally. One of the other things that happens is police departments share this technology. Uh, so it's around. Body cams. Uh, there's a whole host of issues with body cams that I won't go into, um, but it I, is very much a case where we have not set up the rules about how the information collected by body cams can be used and whether they are really useful as a form of police oversight or instead whether they are a form of police surveillance. Hint, it's hint tending more towards the police surveillance. Um, it, all kinds of facial recognition issues that they, they do have uh, very much uh, racial bias, as I was mentioning, but it becomes 
more and more a way to do tracking and feed more information into these various systems they i you i even walking down the street now is much harder to be anonymous they there are systems now that are designed to be tracking you from camera to camera by facial recognition when i first started talking about facial recognition i want to say 15 years ago i honestly wasn't that worried about it because it sucked as a technology um and i should have been more worried that it would get better because it really is now more effective um the i uh, police platforms um is i uh, all about then as i was saying the i uh, predictive policing and the sharing of information that it used to be again they maybe your local beat cop said oh we know joe he's kind of a shady character we need to keep an eye on him which might have been based on reality and might have been because joe actually had an interest shared with the cop's sister and i uh, didn't like it um but now that one little bit of oh joe's a shady character that affected just the beat cop now gets fed into fusion fusion centers and otherwise shared between uh, law enforcement agencies and so now even if joe goes halfway across the state he's still a shady character based on one cop's original view um i'm not even going to get into immigration i uh, the <laughs> it's too complicated um the social media monitoring that i mentioned geophedia i uh, before i where it's presented as oh we can use this to find the terrorists or the big threat to big public gatherings but what it actually is being used much more is for things like tracking protesters because to a lot of government agencies protests especially if they are large protests are inherently dangerous doesn't matter that they're also you know the bedrock of what our free expression and society and how the people can affect society is they're dangerous and so need to be tracked and uh geophedia and other social media monitoring systems have been used a lot for that um unclear the legality of it uh there's a whole lot of this is one of the areas where the legal framework is out of date uh because the question of whether there is privacy in public spaces is gone the predictive policing as i said self-fulfilling uh prophecy um and uh same with the risk assessment sentencing it's all the same issues one thing that i i should mention in here that i skipped over about the algorithmic bias i uh, it's a really difficult problem to solve and maybe unsolvable i uh, <laughs> they even those systems that are designed to avoid bias research has shown don't avoid bias one of the um a recent study came out looking at let's take a variety of i think most of them were in the criminal justice realm but uh, some other algorithms as well and basically doing a high tech version of the old uh, testing where you would send um one white couple and one black couple to an apartment and see uh whether one was turned away and one wasn't so same thing here where they would feed in exactly the same information uh to the algorithm except they would change either race or gender but everything else the same and amazingly enough on 
Well, not surprisingly, that found different outcomes on every algorithm out there, uh, which you know can't be explained away as, oh, well, there's just this correlation between uh, some races have lower income, demographics, worse neighborhoods, et cetera. Exact same thing, just different race, still gets uh, different information. Um, what was most discouraging is that there are several of these uh, programs that are designed or claim to be designed to avoid bias uh, in the algorithm. And this research found they had every bit as many problems as those where bias was not a goal to eliminate. So it's a very difficult thing. So let me just skip on, because I've run over time, to what we can do. Um, and the answer is we have to demand better. Uh, we need fairness, accountability, and transparency. And we need to ask those questions constantly of policymakers and get them to ask those questions. So for any technology, we need to ask, what's the purpose of this and how are you going to use it? And you would think that those would be basic things that everybody is already asking. In fact, they are rarely asked. Instead, it's, hey, do you know that there's this cool new thing that lets us track so-and-so? Yeah, good, let's do it. Um, so uh, we need to know why uh, it's being used and how it's going to be used, what the rules are, how it will affect bias, and it's up to us to demand that our legislators do that. Uh, require that. One uh, great example I uh, hear is what can be done at the local level. The federal level, okay, the ACLU, EFF, lots of other organizations are trying stuff at the federal level, but let's face it, Congress is dysfunctional. <laughs> um, I would not put really any eggs in basket of hoping that we're going to get good federal solutions. Um, but we can get a lot done at state and local levels. I, and we already have uh, gotten a lot done about surveillance at the state level. Uh, Washington State is one of the best places in the country to regulate uh, various technologies. And uh, increasingly, we're looking at local levels. So the uh, city of Seattle, I will use as an example, uh, because they're uh, one of the first in uh, the country oops, um, with one of the strongest ordinances in the country requiring city agencies to come back to the city council with descriptions of all the technologies that are being used, what it's being used for, how it's being used, what the protocol is, how uh, data is going to be handled, et cetera, and getting public input on that. Uh, really uh, a model uh, for the rest of the country. We hope to see that in every other community. Oakland is looking at a similar and even stronger ordinance. The Seattle ordinance unfortunately carves out some things that we would prefer were not carved out. Um, but uh, we need to get those in every uh, city council so they know that the public needs to know what's going on and needs to decide rather than some set of developers making these decisions behind our back. Um, similarly, we're looking at legislation to get more transparency on the uh, public and private contracting because that is where so many of these problems happen. And, uh, you know, I will just say we can do stuff. 
Uh, oh, and, and of course, you can also put pressure to some extent on private entities you deal with. Deal with people who are more privacy protective. Don't deal with those who are less privacy protective. And the more things get out into uh, sunlight, the more uh, changes can happen. The private entities uh, don't want to be the bad guy and um, will actually change practices if it works. Uh, we've had some great successes uh, in our state legislature, as I said, on things like stingrays requiring uh, greater process to use them than elsewhere. We can do it, but we all need to push for it to be done. And that's it. Question about the stingray. Yes. Since in Washington State we have the wiretapping laws, if you intercept the electronic message, wiretap it or intercept it, and record that, that moves the form of wiretapping. And as we saw with the cell phone case with uh, the congressman back east 15 years ago in the Washington State, intercepting and giving that message to somebody else, even if it's for uh, a congressman, is that can be a lot of ethical problems. The stingray would require to work to intercept and provide a cell phone-like signal outbound to link up to which is a licensed radio service that's federally regulated. So how can a city or a local state, without obtaining the proper licenses from the federal government, implement something that is using a licensed band and licensed frequencies? I mean, I'm, right. I'm, I'm just really torn. Right. This is the okay. are themselves committing federal, breaking federal laws and breaking state laws. Um. That gets into agreements between Harris Corporation, the individual uh, local entities, and federal entities. Um, and there's also some leeway for uh, law enforcement to break some laws in uh, doing stuff. But the good news in Washington, as you point out, we have strong law. And there's really no doubt in Washington and even uh, localities here, such as Tacoma, that use stingrays um, all agree that in order to use stingray, even not to intercept the conversation, but just to uh, track the location, requires a warrant or um, exigent circumstances in emergency. But so how would they craft a warrant? Because it can pick up in a neighborhood it, so many people it, driving Right, and um, that is an issue in Washington. Again, we got legislation passed that basically requires a super warrant that gives more information to the judge about who all it affects, not just kind of the rubber stamp, oh, we want to use this device to track so-and-so. So Washington is better off on stingrays than probably any other place in the country, um, mind you. We still think there are inherent problems that can't be solved by that, but at least we're better off. <laughs> yeah. Do you know who was determined uh, who was behind that rogue stingray in D.C. in the last two weeks? There's multiple of them. Yeah, they, I, I don't. It's very high profile. Yeah, yeah, I don't know anything more than what I've read in the papers, which is the same as you. And I mean, it's widely believed that basically. Every um, developed country that has a presence in D.C. is probably using them. Um, so it, it's widespread. Could you yes. show the smart meter slide? And oh, fast sure. Um, yeah, that's uh, another issue that's particularly of uh, interest in the city of Seattle at the moment. Uh, yeah, mine's two weeks old. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and in Seattle, uh, okay, where is this? It's here somewhere. There we go. Um, we are working on an ordinance to uh, limit how uh, smart meters are used, uh, data collect, 
adjusted and uh, that. But yeah, smart meters are again a thing that it's okay, looking back at my developer days, it's great feature creep. The real impetus behind smart meters and at least in Seattle, the number one push for them initially was it's really inefficient to have meter readers go around physically reading meters if you can just get two-way communication. But turns out that in order to get a meter that does the two-way communication, all of them are developed by, thing, by companies who have additional features. So it's not just reading once a month, it's reading potentially every few seconds, tracking data, again, useful for um, determining power outages more effectively, but I, we have worked with the city of Seattle for, I don't know, five years, unsuccessfully uh, pointing out to them that they don't need to be that granular on uh, the data they collect and save, and so far have not succeeded, so um, city council is our next resort. So one of the things with the smart meters too is there's a lot of fear because they have radio there, there is a lot of fear. But, That's not but, our issue. But cellular, cellular meters for an electrical grid for using on homes have been installed on many homes in the Puget Sound in Washington State for 15 years. It wasn't called smart meters then. It was called the, uh, it was another metering network. And so they were a long time for interval meters. And when you really look at what their smart meters are capable of doing, they're not good for a second a minute or second by second measurements. They're good for 15 minute, minute intervals. Right. So, but even 15 minutes is a lot more than once every two months. But, but honestly, all of our internet activity and our cable activity and our, our cell phone activity in the house gives so much more granular and fine detail than a smart meter does, it's, unless you're doing drug, and, and most people are doing drugs are gonna be bypassing, in, Mary, in, in Washington State you can get around that anyway, so it's legal for, for little stuff. So it's not, a, it's not as big a problem as, as a lot of items yeah. think, and I'm an engineer that looks, right. that does it, power system stuff. It, so. you, you know, it, unfortunately, that is an argument that we run into when you look at any technology because the number one answer to anything is, well, this doesn't collect nearly as much information as your phone that everyone carries around all the time, therefore we shouldn't worry about it. And the answer is we have to worry about a variety of them and who's collecting the data on each and what the rules are. We're not saying you can't do smart meters, it's just what the rules are and because it's a government entity, honestly, we have more uh, potential to be able to influence it than we do the yeah, others. And I, and I think so. that's great, and how, how do you want the data used? Because right. for people who are doing developers, it might actually be useful to have a larger data set that's that not to individual houses, but, but these neighborhoods use data, use energy in this type of flow, so you can develop right. products for that. And, but that, what that means is going to the city is if you're going to make the data available, it should be done in a large enough right. amount of exactly. stuff that anybody has access to it, that it's not, it's not yes. down to an individual person. That, that, that's exactly what we've been trying, is we're not saying don't do smart meters, we're saying you need the rules around them okay. to protect the so. the, the automatic meter reading, and the biggest thing of the smart yeah. meters is the disconnect I am way over time, by the all way, right. so I don't know if. It's all right. Other. <laughs> 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 okay.